Kia ora, good afternoon. Today my colleague Regina Morganston and myself Rose Turnbull will be presenting a joint presentation on the critical minerals work that we have been undertaking in New Zealand in the last couple of years. The work we have been completing is primarily desktop based modelling of the critical mineral potential for rare earth elements, lithium and nickel cobalt in New Zealand and together we will highlight the steps we have taken and the results from our work in this presentation. For those unaware, GNS Science, the acronym, stands for Geological and Nuclear Sciences, and we're a government funded science research institute uh, that was once known as New Zealand's Geological Survey. There are four science themes that are the focus of the work that we complete at GNS Science. Those are natural hazards and risks, energy futures, environment and climate, and land and marine geosciences. The critical minerals work that we complete is a combination of energy futures and land and marine geoscience. Like elsewhere in the world, in response to an impending global climate emergency, the New Zealand government is working on several initiatives to move New Zealand towards the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. Among many of the ways to achieve this include increasing our renewable energy production or electricity production to being 100% renewable by the year 2035, we are currently sitting at 85% renewable electricity production. The adoption of new innovative energy technologies to achieve increased energy efficiencies, such as home battery storage systems and the application and take up of green hydrogen technologies and electrification of our transport system, which currently represents 21% of our total emissions, but of which less than 1% is currently fueled by clean electricity. Crucial to all of these objectives, to achieving all of these objectives, is the need for critical minerals, such as for componentry in making wind turbines, electric cars and home batteries, to name a couple. Currently, New Zealand imports all clean tech components, so no critical minerals are currently being produced or mined in New Zealand. New Zealand has a long history of fossil fuel and gold extraction dating back to at least the 1860s for gold extraction. However, very little is currently known about our potential to host critical minerals. Previous work on critical minerals has been very limited to understanding where the occurrences are of rare earth element, nickel, cobalt, antimony, molybdenum, chromium, tungsten, PGEs, tin, nickel and titanium. These all have known occurrences, but there's poor understanding of where new occurrences might occur and also where any of these occurrences might be economic. Importantly, what is currently defined as a critical mineral can change with rapidly evolving technology. Therefore, to be ahead of the game, a jointly funded project between GNS Science and the government agency New Zealand Petroleum and Minerals was undertaken to generate a framework and model by which we can assess the potential for critical minerals now and in the future. The focus of this initial project was on a data discovery and mineral potential study that used the mineral, assist, mineral systems approach to assess the potential for rare earth elements, lithium and nickel cobalt in New Zealand. I will now pass over to my colleague Regina Morganston, who will outline the rare earth element mineral potential model for New Zealand. Kia ora, I'm Regina and I'm going to take over from Rose to talk about the methodology behind our critical mineral modelling in particular the rate with element aspect before I pass the presentation back to Rose, who will talk more about the results of the lithium and nickel cobalt mineral potential, as well as also talking about some future opportunities. So let's take a step back first and view New Zealand in a global geological context. So New Zealand was once part of the Gondwana supercontinent, which was made up of Australia, New Zealand, Antarctica, South America, Africa and India. And this previous tectonic setting alongside Gondwana, as well as the present tectonic setting of New Zealand, have shaped and influenced the mineral wealth that we see in New Zealand today. So back in the Paleozoic to Mesozoic, subduction was occurring alongside the Gondwana margin, and this resulted in magnetism with associated intrusion-related rare earth elements, gold, molybdenum, copper, tin, pigmentite hosted lithium mineralization, as well as other mineralization. 
And these mineralized plutons show similarities in age and composition to plutons that we see alongside Eastern Australia. During other periods of New Zealand's tectonic history, mafic and ultramafic intrusions were in place that show nickel, copper, cobalt and platinum group element mineralization. Recent orogenic events that are associated with the current comp compressional regime of New Zealand have resulted in gold and tungsten mineralization on the South Island of New Zealand, while active volcanism in the North Island is creating the younger epithermal gold, silver, mercury, and rhyolite hosted lithium mineralization. In 2018 to 2020, New Zealand conducted its first critical mineral potential study, and this was a jointly funded project between Geni Science and New Zealand Petroleum and Minerals, which is NZPNM, to examine the potential for rare earth elements, lithium and nickel cobalt mineralization at a broad national scale. So NZPNM is part of the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, or MB, who administer the Crown Minerals Act on behalf of the New Zealand government. So the study provides a framework for other commodity studies that can potentially be done in the future, like platinum group elements, tungsten, tin and molybdenum. And the key objectives of the study was to inform New Zealand government strategy and policy on critical mineral resources, to contribute to management of the New Zealand minerals estate, to provide data and information to encourage exploration of these critical minerals in New Zealand, and also to identify knowledge and data gaps for future research and data acquisition programs. The mineral systems concept suggests that ore deposits are small scale expressions of much larger earth system processes. And there are five components of a mineral system. These are an energy source, a fluid ligand and ore source, an enrichment and focusing mechanism, a trap and a surface expression. And the mineral systems approach can be used both to identify areas where there's a higher mineral potential relative to the surroundings, or you can flip it around and use it to highlight areas where there's gaps in knowledge or data and use those to target future follow-up work. The modeling approach that we used was a knowledge-driven approach rather than a data-driven approach. And this was due to the lack of training points or known deposits in New Zealand that are needed in machine learning modeling approaches. And this approach allowed us to incorporate both national and international model expertise into our model. We use digital geological data, such as lithological, structural, geochemical, and geophysical data to create predictive maps for each of the components of the mineral system, and then combine those into the final mineral potential model for each of the three critical minerals that we studied using a fuzzy logic technique. There are, however, a few caveats to this modeling approach. For example, we had to use many assumptions and compromises when representing the various mineral system components. There are potentially data density biases, for example, in areas where there's abundant data or where previous exploration has occurred. And these areas of missing data are limitations in our model, but we do include a missing data classification, which highlight many good areas that show exploration opportunities. The first critical mineral system that we modeled the potential for in New Zealand was rare earth elements. And there are eight deposit types of rare earth elements recognized globally. These are carbonatites, igneous intrusions with or without a hydrothermal upgrade, placers and paleoplacers, laterites, iron adsorption deposits, byproducts, co-products and waste products iron oxide associated deposits and seafloor deposits. And based on our knowledge of New Zealand climate and geology, our model mainly focuses on carbonatites and igneous rocks as primary sources of rare earth elements and on placers, paleoplacers and iron adsorption deposits as secondary sources of rare earth elements. This table illustrates the thinking behind the intrusion related rare earth element mineral system. So on the left, the figure shows the five components of the mineral system that we touched on earlier, and those map across into this table from bottom to top. So for each of the five components of the mineral system, we identified the critical processes that must occur, how to tell whether those processes have occurred, which are called the targeting features, and then what data can be used to detect them. And these are called the mappable criteria. 
we've expanded this concept as well to be useful for the lithium and nickel cobalt mineral potential modelling. The data sources that have gone into all three of our critical mineral models include the one to quarter million geological map of New Zealand called QMAP, PetLab, the National Rock Mineral and Geoanalytical Database, RegChem, the Regional Exploration Geochemistry Database, GERM, which is the Geological Resource Map of New Zealand. We also mine through a whole bunch of published and unpublished literature. We looked through regional geochemical soil surveys and geophysical surveys. We looked through mineral reports from NZPNM and also included new geochemical analyses that were conducted on existing samples as part of the study. This figure illustrates how we combined the predictive maps for each of the five mineral system components into the final mineral potential model using an expert weighted fuzzy logic spatial modeling approach. This is for the rare earth elements, but we use the same approach for lithium and nickel cobalt studies. And to put it simply, each of the five components of the mineral system must be present and overlap with the other four components for there to be a higher chance of a rare earth element deposit to form. This is the final rare earth element mineral potential map, and it shows that the most prospective districts in New Zealand all occur on the South Island, and they are in no particular order. Marlborough Northwest Nelson at the top of the South Island, West Coast, Fiordland, which is in the southwest corner of the South Island, and Stewart Island, which is below the South Island. And the most prospective rock types in New Zealand, again in no particular order, are highly fractionated alkaline plutons and trachytic dikes, in particular those of the Tapawainuku Igneous Complex in Marlborough and the Mandamas Igneous Complex in Canterbury the alpine dikes warm carbonatites on the west coast, and the placer deposits that are proximal to rare earth element rich alkaline intrusions, for example, the Hohunu batholith on the west coast. So our modelling has highlighted new opportunities for rare earth element research and exploration in New Zealand. Currently, our model doesn't include placers or patioplacer deposits, but it should in the future because these secondary deposits are likely to have higher concentrations of rare earth elements relative to the source. During the course of this project, we analysed some beach sands on the west coast, and those showed the highest concentrations of total rare earth elements at up to 2,300 parts per million, which were higher than the plutons that were upstream of those, which only showed about 600 parts per million total rare earth elements, although those plutons are also fairly poorly sampled. So what are those secondary concentration processes? And on the coast, are they purely related to longshore drift? So by doing a catchment and stream sediment transport study, we could track anomalous samples from source to sink and potentially find a new rare earth element placer deposit. Thank you, Regina. I will carry on now and outline the lithium mineral potential modelling that we have completed for New Zealand. Globally, there are three main lithium deposit types that are economic. Pegmatites, such as the Greenbush's lithium pegmatite mine, shown in this example in Western Australia. Brines, which include oil field, hydrothermal and salt lake or salar brines. And an example shown here is the lithium operation at the Albemarle Silver Peak lithium mine in Nevada, where geothermal fluids are pumped to the surface. And altered clays, such as in hydrothermally altered rhyolitic lake sediments. Based on New Zealand's geology and climate, the two deposit types that were considered most likely to occur in New Zealand are pegmatites and hydrothermally altered clays. The mineral systems model we created to assess the potential for lithium in New Zealand is shown with the various mappable criteria identified for each mineral system component. These include things such as the magmatic rock type, various geochemical fractionation indices, such as potassium over rubidium, the presence or absence of pegmatites and lake sediments, the location of faults, both major and minor, key accessory minerals, including key clay minerals and key minerals that host lithium and pegmatites, and pathfinder elements, to name just a few. Based on our model, two districts were highlighted as the most prospective. The Hohonu and Lyle Ranges of the west coast of New Zealand's South Island were shown to have moderate to high potential, and this relates to pegmatite potential within the granitic batholiths that comprise this area. 
The Taupo Volcanic Zone in the central North Island also showed quite high potential, which was a result of this area having active silicic volcanism, geothermal activity, a number of caldera basins and extensive paleo lake deposits. As a result of the initial study that highlighted the potential in the central North Island, a second follow-up study was undertaken. This study specifically targeted the lithium mineral potential within hydrothermally altered rhyolitic lake sediment deposits. Our model is shown here, which includes a number of new mappable criteria, including the inclusion of geothermal and groundwater fluid chemistry, the detailed location of paleo lakes from 3D modeling, and the acquisition of 189 new geochemical analyses, specifically for lithium and a host of other trace elements from lake sediment samples taken from historic drill hole material. When the model was run, you can see the difference that additional data, geological understanding and a focus on one specific deposit type has shown for highlighting the lithium mineral potential in the central North Island of New Zealand. Our focus, as I mentioned before, was on the deposit type of hydrothermally altered lake sediments. For this model, we spent a lot more time data mining of historic geochemical data to get a broader range of geochemical analyses. We used high resolution geophysical data and we also took 189 new samples from historic drill core and got geochemical analyses specifically for lithium and also a range of other pathfinder elements. In one sample, lithium occurred at values of 3,510 parts per million and 31 samples had lithium values higher than 200 parts per million. And these are values considered prospective for this deposit type. After our model was presented at a national minerals conference, a prospecting permit for lithium was taken out on part of the region we highlighted as having potential. The final study that was completed as part of our mineral potential modelling was led by our colleague Patricia Durant, who's now with BHP. This study assessed the mineral potential for nickel and cobalt within New Zealand. The mineral potential model is based on mafic magmatic and lateritic deposits as these were assessed as being the most likely deposit type to exist given New Zealand's geology. The model incorporates quite contrasting mappable criteria to the previous models, with mafic igneous rocks being a strong component, as well as magnetic geophysical data, the occurrence of sulphide minerals, and other various geochemical parameters. Results from the modelling highlighted areas of interest that were primarily associated with known mafic and ultramafic lithologies in the South Island, although there was some delineation of low to high potential within these units. In summary, our project has proven successful in identifying areas of mineral potential based on our current geological knowledge and the digital databases that we have. Our work has shown there's significant potential to refine the models with further deposit model studies further follow-up mapping, sampling and analysis to fill the many data gaps that we have. As a geological survey, one thing that we have found very useful for these models is regional scale seamless data sets, such as our geological maps. But what we would like to have is regional scale data sets that include geochemical and geophysical surveys, which would definitely refine and make our models much better. What we've also shown is that the modelling approach that we've taken can be readily applied to other mineral systems. Other mineral systems that we could apply our modelling approach to, to assess for the potential for critical mineral resources in New Zealand, include such metals as vanadium, molybdenum, tungsten, gallium, etc, etc. Other possibilities include considering the offshore critical mineral potential for the wider continent of Zealandia of which 94% is submerged beneath the ocean. So we could apply the same mineral systems approach to assess for mineral potential, including critical mineral potential for submerged Zealandia. We would also like to test our mineral systems approach by applying our models to overseas regions and also for different deposit models. If you're interested in more information on our critical mineral studies, and the modelling approaches that we have taken, links to our various reports and presentations are provided here.